Chapter Fourteen of The Magnificent Ambersons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Magnificent Ambersons by Booth Tarkington. Chapter Fourteen. Almost was Lucy's last word on the last night of George's vacation, that vital evening when she had half consented to agree upon for settling things between them. Almost engaged, she meant, and George, discontented with the almost, but contented that she seemed glad to wear a sapphire locket with a tiny photograph of George Amberson Minifer inside it, found himself wonderful in a new world at the final instant of their parting. For, after declining to let him kiss her good-bye, as if his desire for such a ceremony were the most preposterous absurdity in the world, she had leaned suddenly close to him and left upon his cheek the veriest feather from a fairy's wing. She wrote him a month later. No, it must keep on being almost. Isn't almost pretty pleasant? You know well enough that I care for you. I did from the first minute I saw you, and I'm pretty sure you knew it. I'm afraid you did. I'm afraid you always knew it. I'm not conventional and cautious about being engaged, as you say I am, dear. I always read over the dears in your letters a time or two, as you say you do in mine. Only I read all of your letters a time or two. But it's such a solemn thing, it scares me. It means a good deal to a lot of people besides you and me, and that scares me, too. You write that I take your feeling for me too lightly and that I take the whole affair too lightly. Isn't that odd? Because to myself I seem to take it as something so much more solemn than you do. I shouldn't be a bit surprised to find myself an old lady some day, still thinking of you, while you'd be away and away with somebody else, perhaps, and me forgotten ages ago. Lucy Morgan, you'd say, when you saw my obituary. Lucy Morgan. Let me see. I seem to remember the name. Didn't I know some Lucy Morgan or other, once upon a time? Then you'd shake your big white head, and stroke your long white beard. You'd have such a distinguished long white beard. And you'd say, No, I don't seem to remember any Lucy Morgan. I wonder what made me think I did. And poor me! I'd be deep in the ground, wondering if you'd heard about it and what you were saying. Goodbye for today. Don't work too hard, dear." George immediately seized pen and paper, plaintively but vigorously requesting Lucy not to imagine him with a beard, distinguished or otherwise, even in the extremities of age. Then, after inscribing his protest in the matter of this visioned beard, he concluded his missive in a tone mollified to tenderness, and proceeded to read a letter from his mother which had reached him simultaneously with Lucy's. Isabel wrote from Asheville, where she had just arrived with her husband. "'I think your father looks better already, darling, though we've been here only a few hours. It may be we've found just the place to build him up.' The doctors said they hoped it would prove to be, and if it is, it would be worth the long struggle we had with him to get him to give up and come. Poor dear man, he was so blue, not about his health, but about giving up the worries down at his office, and forgetting them for a time, if he only will forget them. It took the pressure of the family and all his best friends to get him to come. But Father and Brother George and Fanny and Eugene Morgan all kept at him so constantly that he just had to give in. I'm afraid that in my anxiety to get him to do what the doctors wanted him to, I wasn't able to back up Brother George as I should in his difficulty with Sidney and Amelia. I'm so sorry. George is more upset than I've ever seen him. They've got what they wanted, and they're sailing before long, I hear to live in Florence. Father said he couldn't stand the constant persuading. I'm afraid the word he used was nagging. I can't understand people behaving like that. George says they may be Ambersons, but they're vulgar. I'm afraid 
I almost agree with him. At least, I think they were inconsiderate. But I don't see why I'm unburdening myself of all this to you, poor darling. We'll have forgotten all about it long before you come home for the holidays, and it should mean little or nothing to you, anyway. Forget that I've been so foolish. Your father is waiting for me to take a walk with him. That's a splendid sign, because he hasn't felt he could walk much at home lately. I mustn't keep him waiting. Be careful to wear your Mackintosh and rubbers in rainy weather, and, as soon as it begins to get colder, your Ulster. Wish you could see your father now. Looks so much better. We plan to stay six weeks, if the place agrees with him. It does really seem to, already. He's just called in the door to say he's waiting. Don't smoke too much, darling boy. Devotedly, your mother, Isabel. But she did not keep her husband there for the six weeks she anticipated. She did not keep him anywhere that long. Three weeks after writing this letter she telegraphed suddenly to George that they were leaving for home at once, and four days later, when he and a friend came whistling into his study from lunch at the club, he found another telegram upon his desk. He read it twice before he comprehended its import. Papa left us at ten this morning, dearest. Mother. The friend saw the change in his face. Not bad news? George lifted utterly dumbfounded eyes from the yellow paper. My father, he said weakly. She says, she says he's dead. I've got to go home. His uncle George and the major met him at the station when he arrived the first time the Major had ever come to meet his grandson. The old gentleman sat in his closed carriage, which still needed paint, at the entrance to the station, but he got out in advance to grasp George's hand tremulously when the latter appeared. "'Poor fellow,' he said, and patted him repeatedly upon the shoulder. "'Poor fellow! Poor Georgie!' George had not yet come to a full realization of his loss. So far his condition was merely dazed, and as the Major continued to pat him, murmuring, "'Poor fellow!' over and over, George was seized by an almost irresistible impulse to tell his grandfather that he was not a poodle. But he said, "'Thanks,' in a low voice, and got into the carriage, his two relatives following with deferential sympathy." He noticed that the Major's tremulousness did not disappear, as they drove up the street, and that he seemed much feebler than during the summer. Principally, however, George was concerned with his own emotion, or rather, with his lack of emotion, and the anxious sympathy of his grandfather and his uncle made him feel hypocritical. He was not grief-stricken, but he felt that he ought to be, and, with a secret shame, concealed his callousness beneath an affectation of solemnity. But when he was taken into the room where lay what was left of Wilbur Minifer, George had no longer to pretend. His grief was sufficient. It needed only the sight of that forever inert semblance of the quiet man who had always been so quiet a part of his son's life, so quiet a part that George had seldom been consciously aware that his father was indeed a part of his life. As the figure lay there, its very quietness was what was most lifelike, and suddenly it struck George hard. And in that unexpected, racking grief of his son, Wilbur Minifer became more vividly George's father than he had ever been in life. When George left the room, his arm was about his black-robed mother, his shoulders were still shaking with sobs. He leaned upon his mother. She gently comforted him, and presently he recovered his composure and became self-conscious enough to wonder if he had not been making an unmanly display of himself. "'I'm all right again, mother,' he said awkwardly. "'Don't worry about me. you better go lie down or something. You look pretty pale.' Isabel did look pretty pale, but not ghastly pale, as Fanny did. Fanny's grief was overwhelming. She stayed in her room, and George did not see her until the next day, a few minutes before the funeral, 
when her haggard face appalled him. But by this time he was quite himself again, and during the short service in the cemetery his thoughts even wandered so far as to permit him a feeling of regret not directly connected with his father. Beyond the open flower-walled grave was a mound where new grass grew, and here lay his great-uncle, old John Minifer, who had died the previous autumn, and beyond this were the graves of George's grandfather and grandmother Minifer, and of his grandfather Minifer's second wife, and her three sons, George's half-uncles, who had been drowned together in a canoe accident when George was a child. Fanny was the last of the family. Next beyond was the Amberson family lot, where lay the Major's wife and their sons Henry and Milton, uncles whom George dimly remembered, and beside them lay Isabel's older sister, his Aunt Estelle, who had died in her girlhood long before George was born. The Minifer monument was a granite block, with the name chiselled upon its one polished side, and the Amberson monument was a white marble shaft taller than any other in that neighbourhood. But farther on there was a newer section of the cemetery, an addition which had been thrown open to occupancy only a few years before, after dexterous modern treatment by a landscape specialist. There were some large new mausoleums here, and shafts taller than the Abersons, as well as a number of monuments of some sculptural pretentiousness and altogether the new section appeared to be a more fashionable and important quarter than that older one which contained the Amberson and Minifer lots. That was what caused George's regret, during the moment or two when his mind strayed from his father and the reading of the service. On the train, going back to college ten days later, this regret, though it was as much an annoyance as a regret, recurred to his mind and a feeling developed within him that the new quarter of the cemetery was in bad taste, not architecturally or sculpturally, perhaps, but in presumption. It seemed to flaunt a kind of parvenu ignorance, as if it were actually pleased to be unaware that all the aristocratic and really important families were buried in the old section. The annoyance gave way before a recollection of the sweet mournfulness of his mother's face, as she had said good-bye to him at the station, and of how lovely she looked in her mourning. He thought of Lucy, whom he had seen only twice, and he could not help feeling that in these quiet interviews he had appeared to her as tinged with heroism. She had shown, rather than said, how brave she thought him in his sorrow. But what came most vividly to George's mind, during these retrospections, was the despairing face of his Aunt Fanny. Again and again he thought of it. He could not avoid its haunting. And for days, after he got back to college, the stricken likeness of Fanny would appear before him unexpectedly, and without a cause that he could trace in his immediately previous thoughts. Her grief had been so silent, yet it had so amazed him. George felt more and more compassion for this ancient antagonist of his, and he wrote to his mother about her. I'm afraid poor Aunt Fanny might think now father's gone we won't want her to live with us any longer, and because I always teased her so much she might think I'd be for turning her out. I don't know where on earth she'd go or what she could live on if we did do something like this, and of course we never would do such a thing, but I'm pretty sure she had something of the kind on her mind. She didn't say anything, but the way she looked is what makes you think so. Honestly. To me she looked just scared sick. You tell her there isn't any danger in the world of my treating her like that. Tell her everything is to go on just as it always has. Tell her to cheer up. End of chapter.